Uh, I will speak on the topic of uh, spontaneous decay of uh, in, uh, almost ground state of, this, of a system which is some, uh, referred to as false vacuum decay, metastable vacuum decay, which is applicable both uh, in various situations uh, which so far uh, uh, seem to be rather you know, remote, uh, but nevertheless, as we have heard several times, in, in view of the measured mass of the Higgs boson, it may be of practical importance, so to say. Uh, so the situation, uh, generically, in normal space uh, time, uh, is uh, arises when uh, the um, potential for a, a scalar field, for example, uh, develops two minima, which are not degenerate, which are not degenerate, one is slightly higher than the other, and suppose that the system lives in this mean. Then, uh, as you can see, uh, it's energetically possible for the system to go to the lower mean, to the true vacuum, or the lower, because there can be additional lower ones. However, there is a barrier. There is a barrier, and therefore, any scattering theory, theory of small fluctuations around this minimum, would be insensitive to the presence of a lower state of the system as a whole. Uh, but uh, beyond the perturbation theory at non-perturbative level, the system, of course, knows that it can go from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, and uh, most of my talk is about how it does it. And the mechanism of um, uh, this decay is very much similar to how water boils in a kettle. That uh, there, is a, um, there is a state with lower energy, however, it's hard to create sufficiently big uh, chunk of, uh, the, uh, of uh, space occupied by uh, this lower state of the system. And the reason is that consider uh, a spherical, and we'll see it in a second by spherical, uh, bubble of the lower vacuum inside uh, the metastable one, the upper one, uh, then of course there is a gain in energy in the volume energy proportional to the volume, right? So if epsilon is the energy the difference in the energy density, then the gain is epsilon times uh, the volume of the bubble. However, there is an interface where the field transits uh, across the uh, uh, barrier in the potential, uh, and uh, there is also gradient of the field, which costs energy. And the energy is proportional to the area of the interface. Uh, with the proportionality coefficient being this, so, uh, the surface tension. And uh, the, uh, there is a loss which is, uh, uh, which is the surface tension times the area of uh, the, the, in this case of the spherical bubble. And uh, therefore, therefore, it's impossible, uh, well, it's possible that small bubbles uh, uh, <coughs> arise, but they collapse because uh, the um, tension pushes them back to the zero radius, the surface intensity pushes them. And the only uh, real gain, the transition, is possible only starting from a finite size, a finite radius. So if one, one plots the energy, as a the energy of such a system as a function of the radius of the bubble of the true vacuum, we see that at first it goes up and only then it goes down so that there is a, there is a critical radius, uh, starting from which uh, it's indeed energetically possible to have this bubble. So uh, the system should produce or nucleate a bubble of at least a critical size. Uh, in fact, well, there is also dynamics in this, but uh, the, it's uh, quite simple. One can solve this problem using, non, uh, using uh, standard quantum mechanics. And, uh, well, I should have mentioned that once uh, the bubble of critical size is formed or larger, 
it uh, then can expand the rolling down of this uh, energy dependence on the ratings. So you know, one can consider the dynamics of this expanding bubble and this uh, the dynamics essentially of a particle whose mass is proportional to the surface area under the pressure, which is the difference in the energy density. Uh, and uh, one can, in a standard way, derive the <coughs> relation between the Hamiltonian, the energy of the system, and the momentum that will give, for zero momentum, that will give just the dependence of energy on the radius, which I showed. But uh, so uh, the energy uh, of the system is zero. It's measured relative to the false vacuum, uh, and it is uh, zero. And uh, therefore, one can find the momentum uh, as a function of the radius. When uh, the radius is bigger than the critical radius, the uh, momentum is real, uh, and one can easily work out the expansion law, which is Lorentz and Weyland. The radius squared, once the bubble is recreated with the critical radius, uh, its subsequent radius minus the time after the uh, transition squared is uh, uh, invariant Lorentz invariant quantity. Uh, and uh, uh, one can then analytically continue this under the barrier where the momentum is uh, imaginary. And as we all know, the barrier penetration rate, which we can read from Rondeau and Lipschitz, for example, is given by the integral of momentum times the coordinate. And one can work out it in all uh, dimensions of interest. Uh, Four-dimensional system, three-dimensional, two-dimensional system. Uh, it's uh, interesting, and it was noticed by Coleman in 77, that a nucleated bubble, you see, we started with a Lorentz invariant uh, system, flat vacuum, uh, okay. although false, but it's flat and Lorentz invariant. The bubble, the critical bubble which nucleates, is also Lorentz invariant, and it is at rest for any observer. You start running by uh, the uh, by, uh, uh, nucleated and expanding bubble, but it will still be at rest. And that is because we measure, uh, whether it's at rest or not, how its center is moving relative to us. And the center is in the middle between the two, uh, the closest part and uh, the farthest part. But for an observer who runs, uh, an observer who runs sees them at different times relative to the, uh, to the observer. Another frame. So, uh, and one can easily verify that this corresponds to the center of the bubble being at rest, and here is the, its expansion, the, the, the time in this direction, the radius of the, in this, uh, in the horizontal direction, and uh, the bubble starts with critical radius and then expands according to the hyperbolic law. It rapidly approaches. Uh, speed of light, and of course the energy for the expansion is the converted energy difference between the vacuum. Uh, now, uh, also, Goldman noticed that it's a lot easier theoretically to discuss uh, this process, not in the real time, the process of nucleation of the bubble for the purpose of calculating the rate at which those bubbles are nucleated. Uh, to uh, calculate it not in real time but in uh, imaginary time or in the in Euclidean space since the dynamics of the bubble under the barrier corresponds to imaginary momentum and momentum contains velocity and velocity is derivative over time. Uh, therefore, if one gets it sets time uh, imaginary, then uh, it's natural uh, system in the Euclidean space. and. Uh, in the Euclidean space, one can calculate the energy of the vacuum considering all possible uh, configurations which arise in the vacuum and uh, uh, integrating, uh, doing the path integral, which just uh, gives the exponent of minus energy of the vacuum times the time over which we consider there is always some boundaries, very time, very time. Uh, now, uh, uh, the uh, fact that the considered vacuum state is unstable is reflected in, in that uh, the energy uh, is not real, but it develops an imaginary part, so that the vacuum state is a resonance assumption, where uh, gamma is its rate of decay. Uh, 
and uh, the probability, uh, the physically sensible quantity, is the, the rate of nucleation, uh, that is uh, the probability of um, uh, nucleation of the bubble per unit time, per unit volume. Since in infinite, in large volume, the uh, bubble can be formed anywhere, and uh, therefore uh, the probability is proportional to the volume, and the volume independent quantity is the rate, which is the probability over uh, volume, and of course over time. Uh, now, then according to the rules of calculating the path integral, one can uh, calculate it semi-classically uh, by considering solution to, to Euclidean equations of motion, and uh, the solution to Euclidean equations of motion uh, uh, correspond exactly to uh, the system that I just described, where we have everywhere uh, large uh, distances. We have the false vacuum phi plus, and there is a spherical, spherical in, in space and time. Configuration containing the lower vacuum, the vacuum inside, and uh, in the Euclidean space, of course, the boundary is described by t squared plus r squared equals to the uh, radius squared of the bubble, uh, but after going back to Minkowski space, t squared becomes minus t squared, so we have the Lorentz expansion law for the bubble. And this uh, observation of Coleman allowed him to develop an expression which includes not only calculating the exponential factor, uh, which I showed to you, but also pre-exponential factor as well. Uh, uh, taking into account pre-exponential factor means considering not just spherical uh, bu bubbles, or in, in the case of space-time it's called bounds, uh, but uh, also considering small fluctuations and uh, summing their contribution in the path integral. Uh, small perturbations around classical solution. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, the pre-exponential constant in the rate per uh, unit time per unit volume has the dimension of mass to the power uh, of dimensionality of the space-time. So in, in two dimensions, uh, actually, it can be calculated in, in a model-independent way. And it does not depend on you know, details of the potential. It depends only on the energy difference between the false and the true vacuum and this proportion to this parameter epsilon. Uh, and there are all sorts of variations of this result, for example, with a model where there are fermions coupled to the scalar field, and those fermions have zero modes uh, uh, in the, trans on the transition region. Uh, the bubble uh, emerges in uh, the Minkowski space carrying fermions on it. So there are more final states, and that enhances the probabilities 2 to power n. It costs no energy since the fermion uh, is a zero mode. It doesn't take any energy, but it uh, creates a new state with a different uh, number. And actually, it can be shown, and I'll, I'll see it because otherwise I will never get to the end. Uh, uh, it's in, uh, in the uh, consideration of uh, small variations er sorry, around the classical trajectory in two dimensions. So two dimensions are just a contour. Uh, uh, variations of the contour can be described by means of simple Hamiltonian system. And it turns out that although initially the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of the coordinate r and the momentum p looks uh, a little bit uh, complicated, one can make a canonical transformation and make it uh, actually quadratic and calculate the path integral exactly. So uh, this result absolute, uh, for the pre-exponent that it is epsilon over 2 pi is exact up to higher exponents of this factor. See, there is a dimension, dimensional parameter in this uh, theory, epsilon over mu squared. In principle, there could be a series in this parameter in the, in the theory, but no such series arise. And, uh, and this is the exact result. 
uh, an explicit example of that uh, actually was given by Michael Stone in 76, even before this, using uh, different uh, correspondence, using fermionization correspondence between bosonic theory and fermionic theory in two dimensions. And uh, it applies to a sine Gordon staircase. It's a sign which is tilted by a linear term. Then every, st every minimum is unstable, and its decay rate uh, can be calculated for a certain combination of parameters exactly, I mean, fully exactly, with the sine Gordon models are solvable in a sense. And uh, you can see here that if one expands the log, the first term uh, in the exponent is. Uh, of the expansion of this exponent is just the general result, and subsequent terms are higher exponents, and they correspond to physically very simple situation when bubbles nucleate on top of each other. So if you have a probability for nucleation of one bubble, then the coincidence of their nucleation would contain double the exponent, three, bubbles, three, uh, three times the exponent, triple exponent, and so on. Uh, <coughs> In three dimensions, there is no such universal uh, result. Uh, there is no such universal uh, expression for the pre-exponent. It's dependence on uh, the uh, asymmetry parameter between the vacuum and epsilon uh, is known. So there is a limited universality. But uh, the factor which is on top of that, and this uh, non-trivial, the dependence is non-trivial. It contains 1 over epsilon to power 7 thirds. Uh, and uh, but the rest of uh, dimensional factor depends on the microscopic details of the theory, how the theory uh, it, it looks at uh, the microscopic scale. And uh, uh, it was done in specific by form model by Münster and Roche. And for example, this factor A was Uh, in four dimensions, any universality is lost, and uh, the result fully depends on the theory. Uh, now, uh, uh, that is about uh, spontaneous decay. That is decay due, uh, uh, due to quantum fluctuations uh, of the false vacuum transition to the true vacuum. Uh, when this topic uh, arose uh, in back in uh, 74, uh, Zildovich discussed it with Sakharov. And Sakharov got quite concerned that what if we live in a metastable vacuum and we are running accelerators? Uh, we should immediately find out whether it's safe to run accelerators in this case. Maybe, uh, uh, as you know, when you boil water, when the water is very clean, the, the bubbles are not formed uh, uh, very quickly. But if you drop a little bit of salt in the water, the bubbles start uh, forming near the salt part, uh, the particles of salt, and so there is catalysis. So maybe the uh, the idea was that maybe collision of particles would catalyze the decay of a metastable vacuum. Uh, and therefore, if we live in metastable vacuum, maybe we will burn it by colliding particles at accelerators. And actually, it was uh, a very simple exercise to verify that if that were, was the case, not theoretically, but just phenomenologically, if that was the case, then it would have happened already by now because uh, there are cosmic rays. The cosmic rays collide with stationary matter. We are being bombarded by cosmic rays, and they collide with each other. And so the integral of luminosity in the collisions of the cosmic rays, with both with stationary matter and even uh, colliding the cosmic rays uh, in the universe, the integrated luminosity, but by many orders of magnitude, exceeds anything that we can do with it. Weak accelerators, and therefore we can uh, safely run those. Uh, although you see, uh, 
uh, it was not very simple to convince Sakharov because his objection to that was that uh, in the cosmic rays there are no lead-lead collisions. That was, there has been no lead-lead collisions. <laughs> so maybe colliding protons is okay, but uh, heavy ions can be uh, bad. Uh, 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 theoretically, so that's the phenomenological, but theoretically it's an interesting question. If we have a system to play with, uh, maybe we can catalyze uh, the transition, uh, uh, the decay of false vacuum system of it by the external particles. And the idea is, of course, that uh, if one looks at the dependence of energy on the radius of the bubble, then if there is a weight uh, of uh, supplying energy to this degree of freedom, then the barrier becomes lower. Uh, one of the ways of supplying energy is not by colliding particles, but by just having a particle. So like the particles of salt that you draw from the kettle. Uh, the uh, particle by just its presence can uh, create the bubble. And it happens when a particle is massive in the vacuum, but it has a zero mode on the wall of the bubble, on the, in the transition region, just like the fermions that we discussed. Because in, it adds to the initial energy instead of starting with zero, with, which is the energy of the vacuum, we start with the energy equal to the mass of the particle. But in the end, in the end, there is no energy associated with the particle. It rides the wall of the expanding bubble as a zero mode. Okay. And uh, indeed, the presence of such particles uh, uh, catalyzes the decay of the vacuum. In the case of two dimensions, that can be easily tackled because it's a problem of capillarity. Uh, you see, the, uh, uh, the bubble deforms into two arcs of the circle of the same critical radius. And uh, there is, uh, you can view it as a tension equal to mu along uh, the sides of this uh, figure. And the tension equal to mass uh, in the direction of the propagation of the mass. And one can work out the effective action as, as a function of the mass and of the surface tension and of the tension of the bubble wall. And uh, it, it exactly corresponds to the picture of tunneling at energy equal to the mass of the particle. One can instead do the integral and find the same uh, expression. Uh, now, uh, um, uh, if two such particles collide, to this, uh, then uh, in two dimensions, the same applies to collisions with energy E. So uh, at the exponential level, at the level of the exponential factor, the energy can be transferred to the uh, um, to the bubble degrees of freedom, and so if energy of the colliding particles exceeds twice uh, actually the mass of the um, uh, solitons that are uh, uh, that form the walls of the bubble in one plus one dimensions, then the exponential factor disappears. However, it's not the case. It's not the case in more than uh, uh, two dimensions. Uh, in particular, in our four-dimensional world, it, it, it's not the case. Uh, and uh, 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 that is because uh, in this curve, the energy dependence on the radius, there are two regions. Uh, so, of course, if we supply the uh, uh, energy to the to the bubble, to the, uh, to the bubble. The barrier becomes smaller at higher, at the higher at energy. Uh, so the barrier factor decreases. The negative factor in the exponent becomes less negative. Uh, however, however, the system has to be excited to this energy. It's initially sitting by a collision of particles. It's initially sitting near zero and you want to excite it very high, which is a very high uh, excitation. If you quantize the system, then the levels start with very low energy scale. 
and x i t, and this should be done at once because the collision of the particles is fast. And uh, uh, this excitation uh, to, to a very high level, that is, say, an oscillator, you want to excite oscillator, a very high level without uh, sequential excitation of the levels. It carries its own exponential, uh, exponential suppression, uh, which can be calculated using chapter 53 from Landau and Beach's And indeed, uh, no, one of them is supposed to be thick, the other uh, thick. In, indeed, what happened? Uh, so, uh, if we look at, at this picture, at higher energies, at higher energies, the barrier is smaller, narrower, uh, lower, uh, and uh, the barrier factor goes down. However, there is another exponential factor which goes up with energy, and it's also named. It's, this is C. Uh, which is the difficulty of uh, excitation of the high state. And it turns out, it, it turns out that the sum, so this is, this is the C dotted line, this is B, and their sum, which uh, stands as negative in the exponent, actually never hits zero. So the exponential separation never disappears. Uh, it, it, it has minimum, the sum B plus C has minimum, which is about one sixth of, uh, this, uh, of the initial value. It's expressed in terms of the elliptic, uh, uh, full elliptic integrals, but numerically it's 0.16 of the initial value. And therefore, a collision of particles uh, never uh, can eliminate the exponential suppression in the rate of the decay of metastable value. Well, yeah, and this agrees with, if you want, with observation that uh, 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 you know, if we live in metastable vacuum, the uh, cosmic rays could have, uh, uh, have not destroyed. Now, uh, uh, the, what about the question itself, whether, whether we indeed do live in, in a metastable vacuum, and uh, what would be dynamics uh, responsible for its uh, uh, transition to a state. Uh, and it became, uh, unexpectedly, became a quite a lively discussed topic recently after the measurement of the Higgs mass, or supposed Higgs mass, as we heard from uh, Professor Tanelli. Uh, uh, and it's uh, uh, not the mass itself, but it's uh, mostly the relation between the Higgs mass and the mass of the, of the top quark. Now, the mass of the top quark, which is measured kinematically at uh, Tevatron, now at LHC, is uh, related in a non-trivial way to theoretical parameter, which enters the calculation that I'm going to uh, describe. And uh, those calculations were described by Professor Grosjean in the previous lecture. But uh, the input parameter, actually uh, depends on careful definition what's being measured and uh, it can be recalculated into a theoretical parameter mass of the top work normalized at mass of the top work it's specific in normalization scheme there is uncertainty in this calculation so the uncertainty in the theoretical input is larger than the like, experimental uncertainty in the top work mass that is quoted in the particle data tables and the reason why uh, the relation between Higgs uh, mass and top quark mass is important for uh, understanding the stability of the vacuum that we live in uh, is the following. So here is the Higgs potential. It contains a negative mass term. Uh, it was presented to you before in a little bit different form, but uh, up to an overall constant, it's the same. So one can write it as uh, in, uh, minus uh, mass term uh, quadratic term, phi squared, plus a quartic term. Uh, so uh, the, uh, at small phi, uh, this negative mass term uh, makes uh, uh, phi absolutely unstable, and at large phi, uh, positive lambda stabilizes because phi four becomes more important than phi squared, 
there is a balance between these two factors, and that sets the vacuum expectation of vacuum, which is 246 G, which in terms of these parameters is given by M over square of the That's where the unit is. It is. And the mass of the Higgs is square root of two times this mass parameter, or it can be expressed in terms of lambda and uh, V, and the, the vacuum expectation of the is the same. And the mass of top quark is the Yukawa coupling of the top quark to the Higgs times the vacuum expectation. Now, lambda has to be positive for vacuum stability, because if lambda is negative, then uh, no matter how big this term is, it's sufficiently large phi, uh, this term would win and uh, uh, the, the, the system would be unbounded from below in terms of energy. Uh, but now lambda, is written here, is not, a, is not a constant parameter. It is renormalized and it depends on uh, in what, under what circumstances it is being measured. If it is measured in processes with large momentum transfer, the one which enters the mass of the Higgs is the one which is measured uh, at the mass of the Higgs. Uh, ho uh, however, in understanding the stability, um, uh, it mm, uh, uh, requires considering the field phi uh, to take large values, arbitrarily large, uh, and at large values of field phi, the relevant momentum becomes of, uh, become of order of the field phi. And that, uh, so the distances are short, and therefore lambda that is uh, effective at those distances is different from lambda, which determines the Higgs mass, but it is related. Now, why, why, it, uh, why it is different than what is the relation? The effective lambda, which is measured, is the one which is input, uh, which is the input parameter, the lambda, plus the uh, renormalization of lambda with all possible graphs that contain four uh, external legs of the field phi. And <coughs> out of all graphs that one can draw uh, at the bottom loop level, the most essential are the ones with the Higgs field itself and with the top quark. Why is that? That is because lambda, both lambda and HT are related to the masses of uh, uh, correspondingly Higgs and the top quark, and those masses are the biggest of, the, uh, of all other particles uh, that enter uh, the um, standard model. Right? So it, now uh, these two uh, effects they uh, compete with each other, actually. The uh, proper renormalization of lambda, that is renormalization by the same self-interaction, almost increases lambda. And that's because the energy is related to the energy of the bosonic field. The energy of the given external field phi is related to the fluctuations of the bosonic field, and those are positive. Uh, however, for the top quark, the uh, effect is negative. The contribution is negative uh, to the effective lambda. And this can, of course, proportional to mass of the top quark to the fourth power, because there are four vertices proportional to the mass. And that is because the energy of fermionic fluctuations is always negative, as we all know, because the vacuum, the vacuum of fermions is uh, the uh, you know, infinite number of negative energy state filled up, that's Dirac C. And so uh, for the fermions, it's always energetically uh, profitable to increase the mass. They would love to increase the mass because then the energy of the Dirac C would go down. Uh, <coughs> and uh, for the bosonic fields, uh, the, uh, uh, they tend to prefer lower mass. The energy goes up with the mass. This can be reflected. Uh, this can be reflected in the equations for the running of lambda as logarithm of the scale. So the scale we can think of is the field itself, phi. And uh, so the one loop effect contains, lambda, contains a term proportional to lambda squared with a known coefficient, uh, positive, and with a known negative coefficient, which is minus positive coefficient, the Yukawa coupling of the top one, to the fourth power. Also, one should consider running uh, the Yukawa coupling of the top quark is not constant itself because uh, the main effect there is the renormalization by the strong interaction. 
for the quarks at short distances the mass decreases. Yeah. It's clear, it, it's clear that uh, with sufficiently heavy top quark and sufficiently large Higgs or sufficiently large HT and sufficiently small lambda, uh, the uh, top quark will destabilize the uh, Higgs field because of its negative contribution. If it is negative, then lambda decreases. No matter whether you started, it will decrease eventually to negative values, uh, which correspond to unstable uh, potential. Uh, so, if lambda at some values of phi becomes negative, then our vacuum is unstable. Uh, so, in reality, uh, it's very delicate balance. It turns out to be a very delicate balance between uh, the contribution of the bosons of well, the Higgs field and the contribution of the top of the fermions. Uh, that is assuming no other particles have a sufficiently large coupling to the Higgs. By the way, uh, it's a very simplified picture uh, that I have drawn. Uh, there are you know, hundreds of graphs uh, which are being calculated, which have been calculated because uh, the effects are known now up to three loops, the equations for running. Uh, the constants, and the constants are essentially lambda, HT, and alpha S. Those are essentially constants. It's uh, uh, due to uh, Konstantin Chetyrkin and his uh, co authors. It's been calculated the theory for power up to three loops. Now, to illustrate uh, you know, the sensitivity of the effect, here, is, uh, here, uh, here are some plots taken from the paper by Isabella Massina, but there, are, there is a number of papers on the subject which came out lately. Uh, and this is a plot for the potential, its dependence on uh, the field essentially itself, use the field itself, uh, in the range 10 to the 17th, 10 to the uh, 18th GeV, that's one or two orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. So since the running is logarithmic, it takes a while for it to run, uh, for lambda to run negative. But at fixed mass of Higgs, 126 GeV, the situation crucially depends on the mass of the uh, top quark. 161 GeV, it's OK, it's still positive. 161.989, 162 GeV. It starts curving. Now, if you add just 2.2 MeV to that, the potential goes down. It then, it then comes up again. So 1.69991 uh, MeV will give the potential um, uh, very uh, uh, below zero. Uh, between 10 to the 17th and 10 to the 18th. Now, what helps here, actually? Uh, yes? Uh, why uh, here they use uh, theoretical mass, not the experimental mass? Uh, as I said before, you see, it's a lot easier to use theoretical mass. The relation of theoretical mass to the actual measured mass is a little bit subtle. It depends on the details of the measurement. That's one thing. Another thing is that the top quark is unstable, it has a width of 2G, which on this scale becomes essential. Because we're, we're talking here about tuning up to you know, 10 mV or 20 mV. Yeah. And there, therefore, a theorist <laughs> prefers to be responsible for theoretical, uh, for uh, expressions expressed in terms of theoretical uh, understanding. Expression for theoretical mass is uh, uncertain itself. Why? Yes, yes, in, t in terms of uh, what is being measured, because what is being measured depends on the details of the measure. Sorry, the down, and then it, goes up. It, go it goes up because, uh, and actually, it's because the mass of the top quark goes down constantly. It goes only down to zero, the mass of the top quark. And so its effect, its effect of destabilization eventually disappears. You see, if it were not for that, our at such a value of top quark mass, even 
given all these uncertainties between theoretical input and experimental number, our vacuum would be unstable. What is important that the mass of top quark by itself goes down, it decreases. Yeah. Yeah. And then it will stop. Well, then it stabilizes, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, what is important that it goes below zero, below uh, our energy. It, it's not necessary for it to go all the way, you know, to. Uh, yeah, to. Yeah, uh, yeah, next page, next page. Uh, uh, this is the same set of curves uh, which is shown in terms of lambda. Not in terms of the potential, which is lambda times 5 to the 4, but in terms of lambda. And uh, uh, so lambda uh, crosses zero somewhere at 161,990. And here is another plot corresponding to the same calculations. There is an uncertainty related to the uncertainty in the value of alpha s. Right? So uh, here, here are the bands. And, uh, this is the mass of the Higgs. This is the mass of the top quark. If top quark is relatively light, then we are stable. We are safe. Uh, once we increase the mass of the top quark, we get into the metastability region. We get into the metastability region. And actually, anything within these uh, limits is possible because of the uncertainty in the value of alpha s. So on top of the experimental uncertainties in the masses, there is an uncertainty in extracting the theoretical quantities and uh, the mass of the top four, and also uncertainty in alpha s. Okay, so there, there is plenty of uh, opportunity to work it out. Sure, young people I can jump on this already. Now, can we leave? How long can we leave on this metastable market? Okay. Uh, so, if we have a system lambda phi to the fourth uh, with lambda negative, then we can consider. Uh, um, you, you see, previously I showed plots in the logarithmic scale in phi. This is supposed to be phi, I'm sorry. Potential, and this is phi, and this is minus lambda phi to the fourth. Uh, we, uh, previously, I showed plots which are uh, in the logarithmic scale in phi. But the tunneling happens not in logarithmic scale, it happens in linear scale. So, we, uh, on, uh, on the linear scale, within an order of magnitude of phi, 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 18th, we can consider lambda constant. We can consider lambda constant and consider just tunneling the potential lambda phi to the fourth with negative lambda. Uh, then you may ask me where does it tunnel, where the system tunnels. Actually, it can tunnel anywhere. Uh, the system uh, uh, lambda phi to the fourth with negative lambda has um, dilatational symmetry, just like QCD has uh, if there are, there are no masses. Uh, no. dynamics. Pure dynamics uh, has um, dilatational symmetry, and according to that, there is a solution which corresponds to bounds in four dimensions. It's not the wall is not thin; uh, it's the transition between the false vacuum and the true vacuum is continuous. Uh, but it can be described, and it contains a parameter r, which can be chosen arbitrarily. At any r, uh, this uh, curve is the solution of classical equation uh, with, uh, for lambda phi to the fourth. Uh, the action can be calculated and therefore the exponent is known. Now, uh, uh, you may ask me what I should choose for this r. Uh, the, probability, the probability is the scale in the system to the fourth power. Of course, times the volume and the time, and in this case, it's the volume and the age of the universe, times the exponent of 8 pi squared over 3 lambda. And uh, clearly, clearly, this expression for the uh, exponent 
has a maximum. In principle, one should sum over all values of R. But this expression has a maximum where lambda is maximally negative, where absolute value of lambda is largest, right? Because when lambda is small, we have a very, very big negative factor in the exponent. So we want lambda to be most negative. And therefore, the value of R corresponds to 1 over mu, uh, where uh, uh, mu corresponds to the most negative lambda. For example, in these curves, it's somewhere here. Uh, and if we plug in the numbers, uh, the uh, four volume of the universe and mu of the order of the 10 to the 18th GV, uh, then uh, this product is uh, the volume, space time volume of the universe times 10 to the 18th G, oops, uh, GV to the fourth, uh, corresponds to a factor of 10 to power 240, and then we use calculator and calculate what lambda we need. Yeah. So lambda should not be more negative than uh, minus point over 0.5. But if you can compound this from below, then it will be instantaneous. Not necessarily. It depends on lambda. No, no, it depends on lambda. Look, no, it depends. Uh, no, lambda, lambda can be uh, if lambda is small and negative, it's unbounded from below. But, but still, there would be not enough time uh, for, uh, and space for just one single bounce to be a uh, critical bubble to be formed in our universe. Or maybe it, it, it has formed somewhere. It's, it, is, it, has, it is expanded. But uh, it's the probability of other one space and time scale. Uh, it could be less than one if lambda is uh, sufficiently small. A small negative. Okay, questions, please, because I am changing uh, subject a little bit from physical to less physical. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the relation between Higgs mass and the lambda parameter. Uh, can you tell if we take the another form of Higgs potential? Uh, there will be another relation between Higgs mass and the lambda parameter, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, in general it's true. Uh, if I just come and draw my hand some potential... Some, some uh, potential maybe. Uh, uh, you see, uh, we're limited. If we want to be able to discuss scientifically, we're limited in our choice of the potential. It's at most vertical in the field of light. Yeah. And it cannot have negative terms. Because uh, the uh, coefficient of the, uh, the uh, fifth and higher powers will be inversely proportional to some mass scale. Right? And therefore, any processes caused by such terms with higher powers of the field phi is a function of energy. Will, will behave as energy divided by that mass scale. So they would grow unbounded by the energy, and the theory would be non-unitary, non-normalized. Of course, people who do uh, theories in higher dimensions do not care that those theories is impossible to discuss scientifically, because those theories are non-normalized. Yeah. But if we want, you know, to do real physics, then we are limited to the uh, to quartic potential, and then. Uh, you know, th this uh, phi squared plus lambda phi to the fourth is the most general um, form of the Higgs potential that we can make. There may be such terms due to some high scale physics. Yeah, what I discussed now assumes that no high scale physics interferes. And actually, it's a frightening thought. It's the thought that we, as far as the uh, higher masses, mass scale, higher energies are concerned, we know everything now. That is it. What we know, there can be only stuff at light end of the scale which doesn't interfere with the heat, with this counting. Because light fields like, say, Ws or electrons, genes, they contribute very little to this balance because it's mass to the fourth which matters. Their masses to the fourth are much lighter than the 
things and how they don't work. Uh, of course, uh, now we don't know everything because there is dark matter which we, we don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that can be associated with some uh, dynamics at small masses. Uh, dynamics. But it may be, in spite of all you know, far reaching ideas which ignore any bounds of common sense, I would say, uh, extra dimensions, uh, uh, maybe uh, that doesn't exist. Maybe we, we, this is this is all, and it's actually good because uh, the, our interest in, to higher energy grows on the logarithmic rebound energy, but the cost of achieving higher energy is go, grows linear. We are already at the crossover where the cost is maximally bearable for satisfying our curiosity, yeah. and maybe if we find out now that we are at the end of higher energy of real high energy. And maybe that, that is the reason. By the way, there is one more possibility associated with this, which is not directly related to what I am speaking, but it was mentioned, I, I think, by Professor Grodin, maybe Tonelli, uh, that suppose that the mass of the Higgs and the top quark just balance each other so that there is a plateau in the potential, like the one which is shown here. Uh, yeah, yeah. There is a plateau, there is a flat part of the potential. And flat part of the potential is uh, of, of some field, which is called inflaton, uh, is needed uh, to describe the exponential expansion of the universe at the early epoch of the inflation, which explains why the universe is so big in the Planck scale and all other wonderful things, and is very consistent with all the data. And uh, if this is the case, if there is indeed such a balance between uh, the renormalization of the Higgs self-coupling, uh, then the Higgs can uh, uh, act as an influence. There is nothing, nothing wrong with uh, it. This possibility can be in investigated. Yes. Uh, you just talked about the normalization, but isn't it true that every theory that includes gravity yeah. becomes renormalizable? Yeah. What is the meaning of the normalization? Yeah. You see, gra gravity is a wonderful theory unless we get to energies of the order of the black mass. It's an effective theory of the distances. We know that it is there. We simply do not know what happens to our notions in normal field theory. We, well, our notions of space and time uh, and quantum fluctuations work as long as we don't get to the distances of the order of the Planck's length or energies of the order of the Planck mass. So the, gra uh, the gravity, we, our understanding of the quantum field theory runs into problems when we start to deal with gravity. That's true. But that starts only at very short distances, shorter than the Planck's length or just larger than Planck's scale. Uh, so our, you know, way of dealing with quantum field theory can, may change with the quantum field so At this point, I can offer no explanation. But you see, people lived before, uh, lived with this before string theory. That seemed to save our troubles, and there were, uh, you know, there were uh, models which were put aside. It's not that they were forgotten, but they became less quartic gravity, uh, which has problems of its own. But, uh, it doesn't have problems with renormalizability, uh, and I, I, I think that it's technical, maybe conceptual. It's not about inventions, it's about thinking. Not, not scenario. You know, but lately people like to describe something for uh, Okay. Uh, chair. Yeah. So what should I do? Should I continue five minutes? Uh, to, 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 to yeah, to me. Yeah. Uh, 
Maybe we better just stop now. Uh, up to you. Up to you. Yeah, but because I, uh, I, I am switching this the subject. So my second part, uh, maybe I'll uh, announce it and then tomorrow we'll start just full steam without any introduction. Yeah, my second part will be uh, my more deep uh, discussion of uh, no, one dimensional systems, one plus one dimensional systems. And such systems are, uh, for example, break up of a string. Break up of a string, and uh, it's not necessarily the string, you know, capital S, yes. but it can be a string which people uh, quite often model in, in chromodynamics, which uh, keeps quarks together. In real life, string breaks if, it, uh, if we try to stretch it because of the production of light quarks, like this, right? Uh, but imagine uh, quantum chromodynamics where there are no light quarks, but only heavy quarks, bottom quarks, top quarks. Then it, uh, it's not easy for the string to break because it costs energy, twice the quark mass to form, um, uh, because when it breaks, there should be quark and then they quark pair at the ends. Or it can be uh, any other system which is described by the same dynamics, uh, that is, tension of the string, one dimensional object uh, 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 characterized solely by its tension, and which can break, and the, the breakup costs uh, uh, certain energy for each end. This system can be analyzed in uh, quite some detail uh, how it breaks, uh, what uh, uh, one can consider collisions of particles there are waves running, uh, that can, which can run along the string. How they destroy the, the string, how they facilitate this breakup. And also, uh, the same subject has uh, relation to the Schwinger process. Schwinger process is a creation of electron-positron pair in an external electric field. So this external electric field, in a sense, acts as a string, pull, which pulls apart electron and positron from the vacuum. And, uh, uh, well, the Schwinger process, which, by the way, was invented by Fritz Sauter in 1929, uh, but was calculated uh, more consistently by Schwinger in the 50s. So those authors were fine. Uh, uh, people are thinking of actually reproducing this in laboratory. One needs some insane electric field, and that electric field can be attempted to be created in a specially chosen intersecting fields of uh, femtosecond lasers, femtosecond lasers. Uh, however, the technologically, there is about a factor of a thousand in the exponent, which is, uh, the field is lower than what is needed by a factor of a thousand. And what I'll discuss, uh, uh, how one can catalyze uh, this process that's what people are trying to do in the laboratory. Yes. Although my conclusions will not be very optimistic for actual observation. Okay, so that's for tomorrow.